I'd like to thank you all for your fine work on behalf of the university for our students who represent the future of our country. I can truly say that since our students are in such good hands, and no lesser mortal than Shakespeare himself keenly observed, it surely follows as the day follows night, the country's future will be nothing short of brilliant. Recent years have introduced considerable uncertainty to economic forecasts. This has manifested itself as an extended hurricane season on the financial pages of the paper. In the midst of naming bubbles like tropical storms and telling people to spend and banks to save and then vice versa, the only sure value is education. And in the midst of all of this uncertainty, Carleton has achieved significant success in all areas of endeavor. More excellent students than ever before have made Carleton their first choice, improving the overall entry average for admission. New academic programs have been developed supporting this growth with new intellectual vigor and academic energy. We have completed several new buildings and have a number of renovation and expansion pro programs underway a fact we cannot fail to notice, even in the dark. The university is definitely a hub of inspiration, innovation, and enterprise, whether it be in economic development or community engagement. Today, I'd like to talk with you about excellence, sustainability, renewal, and resolve for the future. Addressing sustainability, we must speak about the future. Universities often define themselves as communities of scholars who share knowledge and discovery. At Carleton, we've always known that students were and are core to all of our activities and our meaning. Without students, we would simply cease to exist. We've also all read the demographic tea leaves. We can only maintain our current base if we are, number one, extremely aggressive and successful in recruiting. Two, if we seek new basins of recruitment, either geographically, technologically, by altering the age distribution of our students, or by identifying new segments of the population, as has been done in the past. For example, at uh, one point, uh, when there was a similar a demographic prediction, women were invited into universities and changed the numbers. And at another point, the percent of people in the, uh, the percent of the population attending university increased. Number three, we need to create new programs and other distinctive offerings which will attract students. Now, some of you will demur and correctly point to the fact that a number of our programs are already fully enrolled. This is, however, not true of all programs. We can certainly welcome students in the less populated programs, and we will have to work diligently to maintain our numbers overall. To achieve this goal, concentrated effort and excellent communications will be required. Proof of our current success in attracting superb students to Carleton attend our classes today. This has been a banner year, and I'm not referring to our software. We have welcomed us. Boy, you're really not getting them. <laughs> My best jokes. <laughs> okay. We have welcomed a significant number of students with high school averages of 95 and above and several with perfect 100 averages for over, uh, over the period of four years. So I assume that when they're in your class, they're going to demand the same. <laughs> At Carleton, we have managed to be extremely effective and to use our small resources wisely. We have all contributed our personal efforts to this end, and I'd like to particularly thank Suzanne Blanchard, her team, and all the faculty and staff who participated, making this campus a welcome, responsive place, uh, calling students, contacting them, answering their questions, promptly responding when we receive calls. So thank you all very much. So is this effort sustainable? My answer is yes. But in order to make it sustainable, we have to expand our horizons. All Canadian universities have looked at the same statistics and know they will share the same demographic problem. The Canadian population is not growing, and the number of university-age students is concomitantly decreasing. 
All universities will doubtless look abroad for solutions. Only last week it was announced that a large maritime university had experienced a decline in enrollments and would be seeking to make up the difference by recruiting internationally. Thus, we will face competition both nationally and internationally. We can certainly recruit abroad, develop new markets, networks, and linkages. For example, we've been working to establish joint programs in India with high-ranking institutions. Carleton is located in the nation's capital along with several hundred embassies. We thus have a great ad advantage in establishing our international reputation and in attracting new students. Many faculty members have long established relationships with various embassies. Um, an example is a faculty member who called me and said the German ambassador, the new one, just arrived. His son is thinking about applying to a university, could be Carleton or another school, and uh, the student is now enrolled at Carleton. Uh, so please share your contacts with student affairs, help build upon them to create a steady flow of excellent students from abroad. Faculty have done an excellent job in developing new graduate programs. We must now cast our eyes to renewing undergraduate programs, especially those which seem to be drawing fewer students while exploring how existing resources can be recombined in inventive ways. We might look at new courses, new themes, curricular blocks, certificates, intensive short programs, or new ways to deliver courses, whether online or in compressed or expanded timeframes. On occasion, as history has demonstrated, and here I don't mean the history department, but past experience, it is simply a name change which sparks student interest. We must also consider the strong possibility that government funding may not increase. I, th I think I actually could have said that in a little more positive way, uh, but I don't want to think of, even contemplate that. There's the equally strong likelihood that costs will continue to increase. This means that we'll have to be innovative and resourceful, but this is nothing new for Carleton. Is there a way we can impart knowledge more efficiently? This is the question that has recently been asked of all universities by the provincial government. Can we reduce costs through collaboration with other universities? Can we charge for some professional programs and thereby balance funding for others? Can we contemplate extraordinary changes? Or indeed, can we identify those revolutionary changes which have already taken place on campus and explain their impressively innovative approach? Carleton has long been a leader in educational innovation. We can easily point to CU TV and its latest iteration, CU Online or COOL. We can point to interdisciplinary programs and new fields of research and scholarship. We can acknowledge our ties with Algonquin College and the joint programs we share. We can applaud our entrepreneurship program, the many companies founded by our TIM students under Tony Belletti's leadership our service learning opportunities, and research in socially responsible investing by, led by Dr. Tessa Hebb. But we can and should do more, not only for the personal satisfaction of doing a great job, of doing the right thing, but for the good of our students and their future, and for higher education in general. Carleton faculty, staff, and students have always been trailblazers. Let us continue that tradition. To support our ingenious initiatives, we doubtless will need funding, and we shall need the support of generous donors. This suggestion may not be greeted with shouts of joy from all cor corners, yet the finest universities in the world have been founded and supported by generous individuals. Having recently signed a new collective agreement with the Faculty Association, for which we should applaud all those who negotiated for so many hours and so many days on behalf of the entire community. And I see members of both teams here. I would like to thank you all for your hard work. I, uh, I am sure that it was at least a month of your lives that went into this, and probably more when the hours are t totaled up because they just counted days, and I know the days were long days. But I also am very, very pleased that 
uh, new relationship between faculty and staff and unions and administration um, is taking root in this process and that we will continue to work together for the good of everyone in a better and more harmonious way. So that left, leaves me with a hanging sentence that I can't quite finish. Um, we uh, will need to now turn our attention to the task of finding the funds required to remunerate faculty and staff, to find financial support for our students, to provide an environment conducive to learning, and in view of the climate, that means air condition, and probably starting today, heated buildings. Curriculum design and hiring have always resided with the faculty, and we will continue to assure this prerogative. We must, however, understand that volunteers and donors seek engagement with the university just as we look for engagement with the community. In Canada, a number of the smaller foundations have now gotten together to pool their funds and select areas of common concern so that they can make a big difference in a relatively short time. Another recent characteristic is the desire to avoid endowments, selecting projects that could be completed in a short time frame or which can become self-sustaining. This means that all institutions will compete for a smaller number of grants and that the competition's topics and guidelines will be defined by foundations. In some cases, the topics chosen will be, on, will be beyond our scope of interest or exer, expertise. In others, and in particular those relating to social investments, I have no doubt that Carleton has the ability to garner significant support based on the quality of the work done here. I conclude that we will have to work harder and be even more innovative than ever. I do not know who invented our motto, but they were certainly prescient. Ours the task eternal. A scholar's work is never done, and for those of you in the union, it sounds to me like job security forever. We need to pursue excellence with renewed vigor and to be sure that our unique qualities are measured and published in such a way that they will garner the support and appreciation of an ever-expanding circle of friends of Carleton. It is perhaps fitting that in this 300th anniversary of Jean-Jacques Rousseau that we reflect on that philosopher's theories of education. In his preface to the novel La Nouvelle Héloise, he said he was tired of reading narratives which rec recounted the lives of ordinary, ordinary lives of extraordinary people. He wished to revolutionize literature and write about ordinary people who achieved extraordinary accomplishments. Today, we should take his, step uh, his thought a step further. Carlton is filled with extraordinary people. Together, let us accomplish the extraordinary. When I hear colleagues speak of new interdisciplinary degrees they'd like to create in recently developed areas of research, when I see highly developed research projects with far-reaching implications for the future of civilization, when I watch students and colleagues interacting and reaching out to the world around us, I am convinced that this is an achievable goal. Now, of course, the social scientists in the room or those listening in the internet will immediately ask appropriate questions. How do we define and measure the success of such a vague and lofty goal? It's a brilliant question. Indeed, without being a social scientist, I might have asked it myself. It is essential that we state clear goals, define the actions required to achieve them, and spell out what we mean by success. This has already been done in part by the public, pollsters, students, faculty, and staff who choose to live and work here by granting councils, rankings, and rating agencies. Most often, the measures of success are the numbers of students who select a university, who graduate in a specific time frame, who indicate their satisfaction, the number of books in the library, there you are, Margaret, the credentials and publications and grant records of faculty, and the amount of funds the university spends on facilities, services, and purchases of books for the library. This is our opportunity to create new goals and determine the measures of success ourselves. We know the world is changing, and we're constantly told that higher education must change as well. This seems the perfect opportunity for, creating, for a creative university aiming at excellence, indeed, for Carleton University. 
We all know that universities change constantly. New ideas are born. Infinitesimally small particles like neutrinos are found in our own physics department. Books are written and produced electronically without felling a single tree. Applications and technologies are developed and organizational structures are revised and improved. We need to capture the story, create a compelling narrative which will translate what we do so well in a way that we will receive the support we need. Our library is evolving from a fortress for the pres preservation of the printed word to an inviting place for scholars to study and reflect. The evolution is visible and the message is clear. This is our opportunity to propose new measurements to reflect our successes. To continue with the metaphor of the library, it might well be that the number of books housed within the library should not be the measure of the library's success. Indeed, in this age of electronic publishing and digital data, the library with the highest bandwidth might be the best resourced institution, and the use it receives might be a much more meaningful measure. If we consider engagement with the community as essential, we should identify means to measure and evaluate it. Ted Jackson's report, The Oxygen of Community, is a fine cornerstone for such a project as it identifies a high percentage of the activity currently taking place. Today, when rankings are done, they do not consider the variety of programs in place to support student success, the number of interdisciplinary programs, the research opportunities available, the number of faculty doing research in new fields where journals are just being founded, and quite a few of them at Carleton. While they note the number of graduates who are successfully employed, they do not yet note the number of businesses created by the graduates. Carleton shines in many ways. We do not hide our light under a bushel. We simply have not always taken the opportunity to tell our unique story. Today, we have that opportunity with the provincial strategic mandate agreements to do just that. Five years ago, I asked the campus community, our local and regional residents, parents, members of school boards, teachers, guidance counselors, the art and business community, our elected municipal, provincial and federal officials, and those with whom we work around the world to tell me what was special about Carleton. They said Carleton was unique because of its, its sustained excellence, even in the face of adversity, its innovation, its research which solves real world problems, its interdisciplinary and international programs, its location in the nation's capital, and its caring community, which might be considered social engagement with a heart. We then read every resume of every professor and all the plans of every faculty in the, every department. It was essential to find focal points which captured as many of these themes as possible with the research and teaching programs in place and under development. Four strategic themes were identified, sustainability in the environment, health, new digital media, and global identities and globalization. Five years later, we are writing a report on the achievements of this plan, and we're looking forward to bringing everyone together once more to define our strategic directions, our goals, and our plans to achieve them. We will be consulting widely in November, October, November, but we hope to finalize the plan in January. It will be the topic of many meetings and discussions at all levels. It will differ from the past in that this plan will bring the academic, research, and financial plans together, focusing our thoughts and action while streamlining our way of working making us more efficient and more effective. In the meantime, in the summer of 2011, the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, and they've got the order wrong there, informed us that there would be an exercise in negotiating mandates between each university and the province. We understood that the mandate agreements would require each institution to state clearly what distinguishes it from others and what activities we wish to undertake within that framework over the next three to five years. Professor Catherine Graham, who's here, led a committee which consulted broadly over the course of the last year. They identified elements of what will be Carleton's submission to the government. Since the committee completed its work, the ministry has refined its guidelines for submission. 
The first and most obvious difference between what had been developed across the campus and placed on the web, reviewed in every faculty in the Senate, staff and student groups, is the fact that we will be limited to eight pages. So our first task is to reduce the word count. Not an easy task, as you all know from experience. What sets Carlton apart is the fact that our research, teaching, and service within our community and to the community which surrounds us are uniquely intertwined. This harkens back to the descriptors in the strategic plan. If we have interdisciplinary themes, such as sustainability in the environment, the development of the themes is unique in that we have created academic programs in sustainable architecture and engineering, environmental science and studies, and teams are doing research in the areas of energy and water. Our new buildings are models of sustainability, and the canal building is fitted with hundreds of center, sensors and is a research project in itself. The campus community has a sustainability committee and a large number of projects ranging from energy reduction to reducing the use of bottled water. In the area of health, our neuroscience research chair and academic program coupled with the national award-winning mental health initiative offers another example of combining teaching, research, and excellence. And the research in community engagement, the minor in entrepreneurship, and the recently announced masters in philanthropy and nonprofit leadership, along with the combined excellence in community service and job creation by the TIM program, which now has its own academic journal online, provide yet another example of the way Carleton brings teaching, research, and community service together in a unique way which cannot be done in institutions which are not research intensive, which are not committed to community service, and which lack Carleton's inspired and creative faculty and staff. Carleton has its own flower, Rosa Sunesis, a beautiful hibiscus, red with a velvety black center, created in our own greenhouses. Carleton also has its own mineral, Carltonite, discovered by a Carleton faculty member and his students. These two symbols of the joy of discovery and the possibility of science epitomize Carleton University. The fact that the flower was developed by a community volunteer and the mineral was found on a class trip symbolizes outreach and attachment to the community. They represent the eternal and the ephemeral as the mineral is stable and hibiscus flowers bloom only for a day. They represent science and art, beauty and utility, as I understand the mineral is being used in crushed stone for highways in Quebec. They capture the essence of our quest, a quest for truth and beauty, sustainability and excellence. Community implies location. As Yi Fu Tuan indicated in his book, Space and Place, the Perspective of Experience, through the spaces we create, we can offer people a sense of place, identity, and purpose. At Carleton, we have created exciting new intellectual spaces into which we have invited not only the community of scholars here, but the global community in which we reside. These spaces will change, indeed revolutionize our society, providing new ways of viewing ourselves and others. At the same time, we take our sense of identity and purpose from our region. We are responsible to support it as it sparks our creativity and challenges us to make the space of learning as open as our minds, as accessible as possible, and truly excellent. I would like to return to the sessions I had five years ago when I asked people about Carleton's identity. I also asked each group a fun question. What would you do if you were president of Carleton University and somebody gave you $10 million? I fully expected them to say they'd leave town. <laughs> I fully expected the students to say it should be used for student financial aid. They did not. I certainly thought that would be the response from the parents. It was not. Instead, every group I asked said, invest in the university, create new programs, be sure Carleton remains excellent so that in the future you will continue to attract good students, professors, staff, and so that alumni and community can be proud. 
This is the mark of a generous and thoughtful community, one which values the space occupied by the university and one which wants it to continue bringing to the lives of our students a sense of place that they will and can occupy in the world. I thank you all once again for your commitment to Carleton, to our community and the world. I thank you for embarking enthusiastically on this adventure and for your time this morning in allowing me to speak to you. Thank you.